Good morning to everyone from the Office for Global Engagement at Utah Valley University. I'm your host, Baldomero Lago, and today I welcome you to Global Dialogues. Uh, during this session, feel free to ask questions in the Facebook uh, comments window. And if time permits, I will address a select few. Today, our distinguished guest is Mr. Uh, Mark Charlton, all the way from Leicester, England. Good evening, Mark, in the United Kingdom. How are you tonight? Well, thank you, uh, Baldomero. Uh, I'm, I'm great. It's uh, yeah, early evening for me, and it's uh, the morning for you, so you've got the rest of the day to achieve something really positive after this. So uh, excited to be part of that. Excellent. Thank you. As a way of introduction, uh, Mark's interests are in community and public engagement. Uh, his research examines policies that encourage public good in higher education and investigates university strategies for tackling social exclusion in local communities. Mark is also the Associate Director of Public Engagement and Directorate at Social Impact and Engagement at the Melfort University in Leicester, England. And Mr. Charlton, uh, as, as we begin our, our dialogues today, we are honored to have you join us in this virtual setting. And your research looks at policies that encourage public good in higher education. And furthermore, research university strategies for tackling social exclusion in local communities. How relevant, how relevant is the work you do for society? I, I think it's highly relevant. I mean, I know I would say that, but I think there is this important uh, pivot between the university, uh, civil society and government. And there's a, a, a really important role for universities to play in terms of tackling social justice. And it can be done in a number of ways. So it's uh, if, if you fundamentally look at how you arrive at university as a young, well-educated uh, undergraduate, uh, that takes a certain amount of education and look and in some cases privilege to start with and what we need to do is really widen the access so as many people as possible can have that opportunity so that that's just one fundamental then there's the fundamental uh, uh, issue of uh, delivering evidence and research that speaks to policy makers to, to underpin the importance of doing this that a better educated society delivers more social justice and um, in doing so creates a stronger and healthier country and this is this is really important and the university uh, spins uh, the universe seems to spin around the university in in this it, the university is the most central uh, tenant to achieving social justice in my opinion and uh, um, I'd like to say my research supports that. <laughs> that's excellent so it really makes a difference that's that's fantastic um, not too many people in this area in, in Utah probably know where even Leicester is. And, uh, and they probably never have heard of the Mumford University. Would you like to give us just a little bit overview of, uh, of Leicester and also DMNU and, and some of the work that you folks do there? Yeah, so uh, Leicester is a really interesting city. It is uh, the most uh, diverse city in uh, Europe. It has more BAME uh, communities than uh, uh, white British communities, which is really unusual and really exciting. It makes Leicester a wonderful place to live. Uh, we have, uh, we celebrate that diversity. It also brings lots of challenges. Um, we're a city of around 300,000 people and 200,000, uh, sorry, 100,000 of those 300,000 came to the city in the last 20 years. So we're a city built on immigration and, and uh, it's a wonderful place to live and, and, and meet people. And, and I used to say go out to restaurants, but none, none of us are doing that. But we've got, we've got some incredible food in Leicester from around the world, as you, as you might imagine. So we're very proud of our diversity, but uh, also that that's brought challenges for a city with high deprivation. So we've got challenges around educational attainment, and we've got challenges around uh, employability skills and, and quality jobs. And and uh, um, I, within my work at the university, that, that's kind of why I'm aware of these things. And uh, but the university um, 
is a mid-sized university in the city that celebrates 150 years this year and has always been a university to support the city of Leicester. So the challenges that I have spoke about, the university has always tried to be there to improve things and support the, pe the people of the city. And that's reflected in the number of students from uh, Leicester who attend our university. So around 50% of our student cohort and, and our overall co cohorts, 25,000 students, around half of them are from the city of Leicester and surrounding area. So, so we have a real civic pride about what we do and we have a real vision that we want to uh, make the, the world a better place through our teaching and our research activities. So um, yeah, in, in a nutshell, our university is highly diverse, our city is highly diverse and we're in tune and working together. Uh, so it's a great place to be uh, working on, on the functions of social justice and, and, and developing impact. Certainly, I had the great honor, as you know, to visiting your university and also Lister. And uh, to me, it was just an eye opener when, when I walked through the streets and when I walked into the city and to see how diverse uh, I thought that I was in a complete different country, not, not, not even in, 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 in just in a different city, but in a complete different country altogether. Uh, so diversity is is a number one indicator, and I understand that your office actually is conducting um, great work um, in regards to to social impact and and, and social justice, as, as you have indicated. Try to bridge this immigration sector into all this new population that has arrived into the community, and how they are entering and being inclusive within the needs of the community. Uh, and I think that you folks played a, a very vital and critical role. Um, one of your responsibilities on campus is to oversee uh, the United Nations Academic Impact Hub on goal number 16 um, on social justice. Uh, would you like maybe to tell our audience what uh, your role is or what the university's role is in um, working with the United Nations and also reaching out to the community to uh, to introduce and to promote and to work together on on this issue of social justice yeah so um we're very honored to be united nations hub for sustainable development goal 16 and and it presents with it some unique uh i won't say challenges but unique opportunities to uh um connect with um the uh, global goals and how our specific goal sustainable development goal 16 connects with the other 16 goals uh, it also brings with us a responsibility to really do all we can to promote the global goals in our teaching and our research and when as i mentioned earlier we've got about 25,000 students uh, in the university at any one time and if we can create a, a a scenario where those students are leaving the university fully understanding the importance of sustainable development and the impacts of the global goals and how they can apply them through their work and through their research and through their uh, daily lives then that will we hope bring a significant impact over time so our strategy is very much to underpin our teaching and research with the sustainable development goals as benchmarks uh, using the in indicators but also promoting and creating conversations amongst students about the SDGs and how they can be used in daily life and what's it what's important and what um, we can learn and what we can share so, so it's very much in the mindset of all of our students at, at any one time and that's that's the work that we're doing is really allowing people to become advocates and activists for the sustainable development goals how, is it, how are your students interacting or being part of this movement do you have a great influence of the students uh, I and I would imagine probably some students are conducting certain research on, on this sector. Um, but besides that, what is the campus doing to promote um, goal number 16? So for goal number 16 spe specifically, we're creating opportunities through projects. So uh, the students actually uh, how do um, learning by doing. So in, in uh, the United States there's a long-held tradition of uh, service learning and this is only a, a relatively new thing 
in the United Kingdom. And I've just spent uh, the past six months developing that agenda at the university so we can start developing modules that uh, univer university students can uh, study as they serve in the community and uh, um, re receive credits for their modules. And this is, this is a quite a unique thing at, at a British university. Uh, and, and I think uh, uh, when I explain it to my US and North American colleagues, they look at me like, but this has been a way of life for us for many decades. But in, uh, in the United Kingdom, the idea of volunteering and serving has been a long held idea, but uh, actually connecting it to uh, pedagogic approach and, and learning and teaching practice is, has never been uh, championed in the United Kingdom. So right now my work is to position our university as, as the champ British champion in this field and, and, and show other universities that this is a great way to teach uh, sustainable development goal 16 and all uh, um, sustainable development goals and I will say a, a, a nice example of this actually is we have because we have uh, areas of high deprivation and, and, and uh, pockets of unemployment in Leicester it, it brings uh, social issues like uh, high knife crime is, is, is something that's prevalent in Leicester at the moment one of the key indicators of sustainable development goal 16 is to reduce uh, knife crime homicides and, and uh, uh, reduce violence in all its forms and we've done a huge amount of work um, to uh, engage our students to go out into communities and interact with young people and look at ways in which we can steer young people away from from a life of crime or, or, or picking up a knife as a as a means of, uh, of use as a weapon. You know, service learning is something, as you mentioned, that we have done for quite some time and uh, we welcome you. I know that we have been in conversations on, on reaching out and uh, kind of display and showcase some of the work that even Utah Valley University is, is doing at this point. We have a great website and, and I wish my colleague Jonathan Westover uh, would be in, in this conversation because he could speak for hours on, on the benefits. And I remember when I was a department chair at the Department of Languages and Culture, we, we used to run multiple programs on service learning and uh, so very successful and, and life-changing for the life of the students. So I, I encourage you to continue on, on that route because it really makes a difference. And I'm, I'm very happy to hear how you have been able to integrate goal number 16 on, on the peace and social justice and, and as you approach uh, uh, you know the complexity sometimes of the goal through service learning. I think, I think that is, is brilliant the way you're, you're, you're conducting that. Um, for anyone that is actually following these proceedings uh, right now online or even after through YouTube, it's pretty evident that uh, you are in, your co in the comfort of your home and I am in the comfort of my home and, and apparently that this has become our, our current uh, business operations, right? Um, yes, we have struggled now for um, six, seven months, I believe, on, on this pandemic, on COVID-19. And um, how are you folks doing in the UK and especially even in, in Leicester? How is COVID has affected the operations and how is um, England, Britain, the United Kingdom all together, you know, how are you folks doing? Okay, well, it's an interesting question uh, for somebody from Leicester right now because uh, uh, Leicester has uh, been one of the worst hit places for COVID-19. And this, um, this actually links back to Sustainable Development Goal 16, like all roads lead back to S Sustainable Development Goal 16 for me. But um, what's, um, what's happened in Leicester is that we had a, a, a lockdown um, to try and uh, stem the, the infection rate. Uh, but what actually happened was uh, our infection weight rates went up and it was due to uh, illegal operations in factories in, in the textile industry. So well, what uh, we found was that abuses by em employers were actually creating a problem for COVID-19 in the city during peak lockdown. And as a result, uh, Leicester has never truly been out of lockdown. So we've had a lot of uh, uh, challenges around that. Um, we've, never, we've never had uh, fully eased restrictions in our city, whereas other pockets of the country have been able to socialize more to to go out back into restaurants and, and, and bars and things but 
our city. Uh, we like to call ourselves the lockdown champions of 2020 because nobody's spent longer <laughs> inside. But it, it's, it's funny on one hand, but we're kind of tired of it now, you know, and we want to get out and do things. The United Kingdom has not handled the situation particularly well, I have to say. Um, there are huge controversies over how uh, uh, um, key decisions have been made in terms of keeping people safe, particularly those who uh, uh, elderly um, and vulnerable uh, people who live in care homes and, and residential care. Many of those have lost their lives. Um, there are um, the uh, I'm a, a big fan of CNN and I've seen what's happened in America. So I, I don't think our situation is uh, truly comparable with some of the decisions that have been made in in America. And um, and and but I do think that we had the opportunity to handle it better and miss that opportunity. So I'm kind of disappointed with that. Um, yeah, and uh, so it's all relative to, to how we live in, in this country, as, but um, we understand we've seen what's happened in other countries around the world and some of, some of them have really led by example and done really well. And then others, other governments have really failed. And I think ours, and, uh, it would take a lot uh, to convince me otherwise, having I, lived it. I, I understand. And um, how are been the university operations? Uh, have you been able to even hold classes, or you know, what, what changes have you folks done in in order to maintain, you know, the academic uh, courses and the enrollment? Yeah. So um, the uh, everything moved online very quickly when when the pandemic hit. Uh, and then when things started to ease off uh, a, a little bit, the uh, university uh, was able to develop a blended model and universities and schools were allowed to have people on campus and doing things. So they had a reduced number of students on campus going into classes and then a, um, and, and then a, an equivalent number watching the classes online. But we went back into lockdown very quickly. So that opportunity uh, was lost again. And um, then it went, it, it's currently back to, to teaching online, uh, which is uh, really challenging, I think, for lecturers. I, I imagine this is very complicated. Um, however, uh, the UK is leading the world when it comes to the vaccine. And uh, I'm so proud of uh, the Oxford folks that have been able to come up with a, an incredible device, which it appears now that the latest research is even better than, than some of the vaccines that are being uh, uh, set up here in the United States. Um, what, what, what is the general feeling from the community, from, from as a country, uh, in regards to uh, the Oxford vaccine? The, the good thing is, and I, I can link uh, President Trump into this as well, as, and, and, and my own government, uh, led by Boris Johnson, uh, and I, yeah, I might get fired later, but I, I would say that the, the, uh, um, the the, uh, in my opinion, the Trump administration and the Johnson administration, uh, certainly during anti, uh, the, the pro-Brexit campaigning, put a lot of distrust in science and evidence and, and, uh, and academics and, and rigor and research. And uh, the, the, whole, uh, the whole idea one, uh, one politician in the United Kingdom, quite a high profile one, Michael Gove, said, uh, we've, we've, we've heard quite enough of these so-called experts. <laughs> and he, when he was referring, somebody was referring to a piece of university uh, research that completely flawed his argument and just dismissed that people are sick of hearing from the experts. They, 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 and uh, this really undermined the scientific community in the United Kingdom. And what COVID-19 has done, if, if, it, if it's done anything good, is actually restored uh, uh, people's faith in science and scientists and, and actually created a new interest in uh, um, the ability for the scientific and research community to come over these challenges. So I think that's a very positive outcome in what was a very bleak time led by uh questionable leadership shall we say you know speaking of the question of leadership as you are well aware we just um 
Well, we had elections in the United States on November 3rd, and we're still, apparently, the president continues to deliberate if this is being a rigged election or not. But it's pretty um, obvious at this point and that uh, we will have a new president in the United States uh, starting on January 20th at noon uh, with uh, the the experience of having Joe Biden being in the administration for many years and now going, going to take the helm of this nation. How are the Brits uh, and the rest of the UK viewing this result? And uh, are they optimistic on building uh, stronger relationships between the US? Because I, uh, I have the gut feeling that uh, the UK is in need right now to strengthen relationships after the exit Brexit with mm -hmm. other nations. So what, what are the current thoughts going around town uh, in the UK? Yeah, so the, fundamentally what, what's interesting is I don't think that the world is very impressed with Donald Trump and uh, particularly I don't think they were impressed with him beforehand in that the whole world was screaming or very few people outside of the US were supporting the idea of another Trump administration just um, the the fear of uncertainty and, and the, the values that he stands for. What what has really uh, uh, exacerbated that that uh, situation is that Trump's inability to play fair and respect democracy. And I think this this is a new concept in not only in the United States but across the world that that. The leader of the leader of the free world is is not is not respectful of democracy. Is really something, you know, the democracy in the United States is supposed to be the model democracy of the world, and uh, currently the 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 state the status is that the sitting president thinks that that it's corrupt, that that, that it's full of cheats, that he 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 won't hand over the presidency because he thinks there's foul play. And this this is quite astonishing. From a, from a British point of view specifically, what what is almost quite heartening. I was I was anti Brexit. I've got very strong European ties, and it it was sold on a divisive nature. And you, you're, I think you're feeling that level of divide in the US over similar issues at the moment. Um, and 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 so you, so the US is uh, got a politically d divided. Uh, 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 country and, and the United Kingdom is very similar to that and I was very much on the side of anti-Brexit, remain in Europe, let's work together with our partners and and uh, do this and when Johnson allied himself with Trump which wasn't so long ago they were like you know together and two, two big beasts you know political uh, political monsters, I'd like to say, but in my opinion, but uh, two two people who share similar values and I, that I don't think are positive values. Um, my feeling was, if Trump gets in again, this will just make Johnson Johnson unbearable when, as as he enters the final periods of Brexit. And the wonderful thing is that uh, Biden, uh, you know, a, a descendant of the Irish, a deeply European. Uh, 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 descendancy uh, has now taken to office. Uh, Johnson uh, insulted his uh, 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 Barack Obama when he was president, and obviously Biden was completely close to, to to Barack Obama. So now suddenly our prime minister has got to go cap in hand back to the White House, <laughs> have some kind of apology or acknowledgement that. Uh, he will have to start thinking slightly differently uh, in order to get things that he wants done. Where And uh, my hope for me is that Biden is going to intervene some way in Brexit, particularly on, uh, I don't know how well people know British and Irish relations there, but there's a, uh, something that we've managed to uh, stop uh, and is, is to have uh, peace in Northern Ireland for the past, uh, um, the best part of, uh, 30 years now uh, due to the Good Friday Agreement which would be lost as part of the Brexit deal and, and Trump didn't seem to care about that but I know Biden does and this is I think peace is a really important thing not just because I'm a champion of SDG 16 but actually I, I 
you know, I knew of young families who, who were affected by the violence and, and, and the war and, and I knew people who lost family and friends through terrorist stacks during that time, which is uh, thankfully becoming uh, a, part, a piece of history rather than a piece of reality. So I'm desperate for the good things that have been achieved not to be un, un, unraveled by some uh, uh, polit political uh, chest beating really so uh, yeah I'm excited for that Biden's president you know it's interesting how unfortunate it is that um, there are divisions in all nations and this uh, polarization on, on different issues uh, in the UK you know when it comes to Brexit uh, I have seen it uh, I have witnessed it right that the different uh, groups of individuals uh, fighting for the traditional routes of, of yes we need to be our own uh, government or own institution, we don't need the Europeans and so forth. And then the opposite, which I consider the youth, the, the new waves and of thinking and development, you know, that they're looking for that opportunity and, and now things have shut down. And the same, the same parallel occurs in the United States. We are a very divided nation, as you probably have seen on the percentages. I know that President Biden has won the election, but by considerably a small margin and uh, understanding the the, the circumstances that we have all lived here for the past four years in this in this country. So um, someone would, from the outside would would consider that uh, uh, the scores, the scoring sheets coming from the elections would have been very different. I mean, Biden, you know, skewed possibly, whereas Trump would have been lost. But but to see that that we still have a lot of work to do in the U.S., having the results being so close, and and Trump has tried to contend those results for so long. So, so it's, it's work of democracy, as you mentioned, and something that we will have to continue to, to evolve, as well as the, as the Brits will have to, to think about Brexit, and um, they may embrace it, they may not, who knows what is the future may say, right? I, I know what the latest negotiations have been with the EU, uh, but then again, um, uh, I think the consequences or Brexit wakes up and moves quickly and starts doing uh, something very effective for their own economics. And uh, I think if not, I don't know what's, what's going to happen. But, but you know, you have politicians, you have leaders, that they think they know best and, and we'll see. And then the, the voice of the people vote those politicians in. And, and uh, we know, but I, I love your point when it comes to peace. I think that, uh, let us not forget that that's the essence of happiness, right? To make sure that you are living in a very free and open environment that you can exit your house without no problem. And, and I remember vividly the, the issues with Northern Ireland and, and what took place and with all the bombings and all, and all the deaths, just like in other nations around the Europe, even uh, inclusive my own nation in Spain with ETA and some other terrorist groups, right? So um, anyhow, we, we will proceed and we will move forward. And it's, it will be wonderful for us to witness uh, what's going to happen and what's 2021 going to bring, right? I mean, this is another another new year and I hope it's new and I hope it brings us a lot of, a lot of good. But before I conclude today, there is one item that for many um, U.S. citizens uh, still uh, wondering and, and even research more in Google than, than what's happening with Boris Johnson or even Brexit. And that is what's happening with uh, Prince uh, Harry and, and Meghan Merkel that have left uh, Buckingham Palace and decided to move to California. And uh, how is that viewed uh, under the, uh, the British lenses or the, uh, or the tabloid in, in the UK that uh, the, I, I can't remember if it was the third or the fourth heir to the throne has all of a sudden decided, hey, I want my own freedom. I want to own my own life. I'm just moving even outside the country so I can raise my children, you know, a different total setup. Uh, you know, th does the queen feel that she has been stabbed in the back? I mean, how, what, you know, as, 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 a, uh, as a British individual, what, what do you tell us? Well, what I can tell you is that I, I don't really know. <laughs> but <laughs> I, would, I, would think, I would think that my guess was the Queen probably doesn't feel stabbed in the back. She probably feels like any loyal grandmother. I think, I think it's kind of, uh, there's a mystique ar around the royal family and there's protocols and they, they uh, um, live in a very unusual circumstance in that, that we pay for them to be the, the royal family that represent uh, 
Great Britain and, and the uh, Commonwealth. But uh, the um, the reality of the matter is, and, and you can you can go back through uh, British royal family history. It's never they're never too far away from controversy. You know, even even if you if you start with Henry VIII and he's cutting off the heads of his wife because he because <laughs> he doesn't find her attractive anymore to um, the, uh, affairs uh, in in the 1930s and 40s uh, and and the, this the the royal family is is an intrigue it's an enigma and and that the, the one thing the one thing that despite all of this the the british public are always incredibly proud and defensive of their royal family and i think that the the press have perhaps latched onto this idea that um harry with his new beautiful wife has somehow betrayed his family by deciding he wants to go and live a happy life <laughs> somewhere else. So, and, and that's the ludicrousness of the situation. And, and people do see it as, well, the, they're the royal family. They've got everything they absolutely want, or they would ever want. They've got money, they've got wealth, they've got, they've got influence. And uh, yet Harry isn't happy with um, um, the United Kingdom and has to move to another country with his wife. I mean, um the uh harry lost his mother in, in, in you know deeply controversial circumstances without getting going too deep into it lots of conspiracy theories about that lots of um lots of uh, fundamentally uh, uh what was proven was she was relentlessly hounded by the british media and uh, was actually escaping from paparazzi as she died if uh, um that's um you know that's how so in his head does he want to think do i want to hang around and you know see my end like my my, my mother did or put my wife at risk or my family at risk or do do i just want to uh i, I didn't know it was in california it sounds very nice actually <laughs> you know do i want to go to california and live a different life to this you know yes i probably do so so from my point of view i have every sympathy and he 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 should he should do what brings happiness to himself particularly if he can afford it <laughs> well let me, let me share with you that uh, the tabloids here are covering that um, their relationship and uh, very well and sometimes um, i wonder what the u.s i'm sorry what the uh, british media and I, I know very well on, on the British paparazzi and, and uh, what actually took place with Lady Diana and, and uh, how aggressive sometimes they are. And it will be interesting to see the perspective since we don't, uh, we don't follow all the, all the media that is happening in the UK. But, but anyhow, I think our, our time is up and uh, Mark has been such a treat uh, having you. And, and explore different topics from, from social justice to the work that you folks do at the University of Denmark, and as, as well as um, the importance and relevance of the sustainable development goals in our society, as well as Brexit and some other topics that we have discussed and even COVID. So again, I want to thank you. And uh, I also want to thank everyone for uh, helping make this a successful event. Um, and I want to remind everyone to join us at our next Global Dialogue on Tuesday at the same time, 11 o'clock in the morning, Utah time. At uh, this time, we will be welcoming uh, Shamira Harnish. Samira, she is the Executive Director of Women of the World. And uh, if anyone would like to see our, our schedule for the, actually December 8th will be our last Global Dialogue for the year. And then we'll resume back again in, in January. So if you want to see the full schedule for next semester, um, feel free to access our website, uh, www.uvu.edu forward slash global. And again, Mark, thank you. Uh, please stay safe and, uh, and we'll continue our discussions in the future. As we sign off, um, make sure that you choose to be a global citizen. Thank you to all and have a good day. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.